Thank you, Jonathan and Grant. I invite you to stand with me as we read the call to worship together as found in the bulletin and also on the screens. Come now to worship, for in this time we seek to learn of our God, our Creator, understanding the teachings of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, and feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. Come to worship in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in that spirit, I invite you to greet each other in the peace of Christ. Holy Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Spirit of God, we thank you for coming, humbling yourself to come into this house and dwell with us. We look for your presence to equip us, to inspire us, and to be your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. I want to give you a big welcome this morning to our church here at Kettering. We know that you folks come for inspiration, and I know that. Hey, Victor, how are you? Hey, I'm, I'm doing great. How are you doing? Yes, what are y'all doing? I'm preparing. Oh, are you getting ready for this race? You betcha, it's you a 5K. It's going to be great. It. Yeah, right we're... here in the lobby. That's right. And somebody says 25. you can sign up to walk or run. On Monday, online, if you want. 5K. 5K. Is that? 5K. I think that's about three miles. It's not far at all, and it's Rock, all going to be off walk. road. Yep. Save the day. Hey, I'll look forward to it. September 25. Okay. 8 o'clock. September 25. <laughs> The nerve of those guys. <laughs> I hope you got the intent of that, and that is whether you jog, run, or walk, we hope that you will move on September 25 as our health team sponsors a run that will benefit the women's shelter down, 
downtown. I wanted to um, also ask an important question this morning. How many of you came into the church from the north side? Raise your hand. Did you notice any changes? <laughs> That's part of Project Renewal that we've been working on. We put the carpet in about a month and a half ago. And if you notice, the new ceiling in that side matches the, the flow of the carpet. And boy, is it brighter there. You can see one of the interesting things that I noticed this morning was that a lot more people were congregating over in that foyer than normal. I, maybe it's because it's brighter. I'm not sure. But that, that was a wonderful thing to see. Um, I just want to report to you that the, this next week we're going to do the same thing to the other side. The hallway leading down to the beginners and nursery is going to be, the ceiling is going to be raised and that will greatly improve feeling of the size of it and of course the lighting will be better. We still have one other aspect of our second phase of uh, project renewal and that is the sound baffling that will go into the narthex. It will deaden the reverb. It's like two and a half second reverb in there, which greatly enhances the noise when anything's or anyone's in there. The only problem with that pro part of the project is that we have not received sufficient funds to carry that forward. So here's my plea for you, is to think once again of giving to Project Renewal so that we can finish that phase and then head on to the third phase in the future, which is our bathrooms. We hope to redo them all and very modern. So I like what's happening. I hope you do too. But we need you to con uh, consider giving towards Project Renewal to see these projects of facelifting our church up. Secondly, uh, Jerry wanted me to announce that next Sabbath is men's chorus. And if you sing, have ever sung, and would like to join them, they'll meet here in the choir loft at 9.30 next Sabbath morning to practice. And then please make note that the Pathfinders are signing up for... Um, for their registration this tomorrow, one to four at the Centerville Church. I think there's an insert about that. Also, in the month of September, we're going to do, I think, our third CHIP program. How many of you have taken CHIP before? Okay, I see a smattering of hands. It's a great program to not only improve your heart, but to lose weight and to uh, better your lifestyle. And we have a short video for you to see about that program. Killing you? Are you dying for a double cheeseburger and fries? 70% of all deaths are now attributed to lifestyle choices. And thanks to obesity-related health issues, this will be the first generation to live shorter lives than their parents. We all know the solution. Move more, eat better. But we also know the power of bad habits. How do you change an entire lifetime of unhealthy choices? You can't do it alone, but there is help. CHIP is the lifeline you've been waiting for. You'll see a big difference in just 30 days. Heart disease, cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure. These diseases, virtually unknown 100 years ago, are now responsible for three out of four deaths. Today, obesity is the number one health concern in North America. But our unhealthy lifestyle isn't just affecting adults. Obesity and its lifelong health consequences is now the top worry for children. But what hope is there for children if parents are settling for a life of medications, dialysis, angioplasties, and bypasses? Clearly, our indulgent Western lifestyle isn't working. But how can we change? You need to know lifestyle diseases aren't just preventable, they're largely reversible. And with the CHIP prescription for health, you can see changes in 30 days. Clogged arteries begin to open up. Blood pressure.
people eat more and weigh less, and high cholesterol levels drop more than 20%, and the extra pounds come off. How? By making safe, simple, painless, and deliberate lifestyle choices. It's all about your choices. CHIP gives you the education, motivation, and supportive community to make smarter choices. The CHIP program was founded by Dr. Hunts Deal, director of the Lifestyle Medicine Institute. Along with esteemed researchers, Dr. Deal has shown that through simple lifestyle changes, many of today's killer diseases can be turned around. Now, he's taking that message around the world, liberating people from a life of obesity and disease. 50,000 CHIP graduates are living proof. CHIP works. The CHIP clinical results, based on before and after clinical and lifestyle evaluations, have been published in close to 20 medical journals and medical professionals around the world are taking notice. And so are corporations. By bringing CHIP to their workers, progressive companies are reducing their medical costs and improving productivity. I was on seven pills and oxygen and one year to live. Since I found CHIP, I've lost 85 pounds and I'm now living the best life ever. In the CHIP program, you will be given attractive and easy to use program materials targeting important health and lifestyle issues. New behaviors are reinforced by the CHIP support team, our staff, alumni, and current members. The friends you make here are friends for life in more ways than one. These changes are much more powerful than medication. Every community should know about the CHIP program and give it a try. CHIP can help you get the healthy life you've dreamed of, kick the old habits of the so-called good life, and with CHIP, step confidently into the best life. In your bulletin, there are two announcements for CHIP under community is uh, some information sessions. If you want more information about CHIP or would like help in signing up for this program, uh, the next three evenings there are going to be information uh, sessions over at the hospital. So just use that and then of course they're needing volunteers. That's the other announcement. All right, it's time for our children's lesson. If, uh, these kids would come up. We're, they'll be collecting the education dollars, so pass those to the end of the aisle, and kids come forward. I want to know this morning how many of you have prayed and asked for something and that prayer was answered yes. Have you had that? Yeah, good. You know, when I was five years old, I prayed a prayer and had it answered yes. My favorite toy was an Indian tomahawk. It was plastic. It couldn't hurt anything. But that was my favorite toy. And one day I lost that. 
I wanted to play with it, and I couldn't find it any place. I searched through my toy box. I looked under the bed. I went through my closet, and finally I gave up. And you know what I did? I went to my mom, and I said, Mom, I can't find the tomahawk. Where can it be? And she said, Have you checked the toy box? Yes, I have. Have you looked under the bed? Yes, I have. She went through all those different things. Yes, Mom, I've done it all. And then something popped in my head, something that I had learned at Sabbath school time, and that was sometimes when you need help, we should do what? Pray. Right. So I said to my mom, but I haven't prayed yet. And so together we knelt down in my room, and I prayed a simple prayer, dear Jesus, Help me to find my tomahawk. And then my mother said, let's look in your toy box again. And with mom's help, we went and looked in it, and guess what? It was there. And I had my tomahawk, but I was more excited about getting a yes to my prayer than even the tomahawk. That felt so good. Have you ever, though, prayed when what you asked for, you didn't get. Have you ever done that? You have? I'm not going to ask what you prayed for because you didn't get it. But I'll tell you one time I did that. My cousin, when I was about seven, was about one year older than I was. And while I was at church one evening at Vespers, my dad came up because I was sitting on the front row. That's where I like to be. And he tapped me on the shoulder and he said, come with me. And I thought, oh my goodness, what have I done wrong? I thought I was in trouble. But when we got out, he said, Joy, your cousin, we've just found out he went swimming today and he drowned. Oh, that was terrible news. That I had never expected that at all. And we left the meeting and went over to my grandparents' house. And when I got there, it was not the normal house I was used to because my grandparents were so distraught because my cousin had been staying with them at the time that they were crying. You, I could hear my grandmother wailing with tears of sadness and I thought this is terrible I don't want to hear it I don't want any of this and it upset me so much that I went outside the house and I walked around and around that house and you know what I was doing while I was walking I was remembering something else I had learned at church I remembered that Jesus had raised people from the dead and I thought that's the only solution to get my grandmother to stop crying is to, for Jesus to raise my cousin from the dead. And so I prayed, dear Jesus, please raise my cousin up. Let him live again. And you know what Jesus did? Nothing. I didn't get that prayer answered. I was sure Jesus could do it. And I was sure that that would help my grandmother but my prayers weren't answered then. And you know what? I don't know why. But I'll tell you one thing. Pastor Carl's sermon today is going to talk about when God doesn't answer your prayers. And I can tell you also, it's really good. So if you want an answer to why God sometimes says no or wait or whatever and doesn't answer your prayer like you want it to, Listen, and he'll explain. You can go back to your seats now.
Lord Jesus, because you first loved us, we love you in return and gratefully acknowledge your presence in our lives and the countless gifts that you give to us by returning our tithes and offerings. Bless us as we continue to serve and live for you and to share your love to others. In Jesus' name, amen. It's so good to see families returning from vacation, and you know why. Because school has started already down at Spring Valley Academy. Next week, the college students will be coming back to Kettering College. And all around, families are returning to the routines of school life. It's also a very important time in our church life, too, because we know what so much happens at school for building character and training as well as knowledge. And so we as a church like to dedicate um, our teachers to the fine work that they're going to be doing this next year on behalf of our children. So if you are connected to education in any way, if you're a teacher, if you sit on the board of Spring Valley Academy, if uh, you homeschool your child, Whatever, if you're connected to Christian education, would you please come up forward? We would like to have a special prayer of dedication for you. Don't be bashful. Please come forward. And while you're doing so, I'd like to say, when I took uh, a course on education and seminary, I learned that Ellen White had said that teaching was one of the finest works that a person could do. And I thought, well, that makes sense because of what they're doing. Then I realized, then I realized that uh, what she was actually, she was using the word finest in the early 1900s or 1800s definition, which didn't mean it was the best. It meant it was the most tedious job that could be done, like the finest works of a, a pocket watch or something. So recognizing that and if you've ever taught in a classroom before you know it's difficult keeping track of all of those kids and uh, developing plans that reach out to each child so we just thank each of you for your commitment to our children your willingness to work the many hours more hours sometimes than you get paid for to uh, cover uh, helping our children to become the very best men and women that they can. And we'd just like to have a prayer for you folks that are here. Isn't it a great group for us? And Elliot, would you offer that prayer? Uh, just in a uh, simple way, I'd like to have you each place your hands on someone next to you. I recognize you all as uh, ministers in a certain aspect, that you minister to our kids, my child, and uh, all these children, and so we are asking for this commissioning to be on everyone here today. Would you please bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, what a group of people that are gathered before us that have given their lives to teach. And Lord, they are dedicating this year to you, I pray, as they have already probably, for some of them, already started it, some are still preparing. But God, this is a holy ministry. And I pray, God, that you would just continue to lift them up in our minds so that we could lift them up in prayer each and every day. They have a tremendous task, and for that, God, we ask for strength and patience and peace to be upon them, that your Holy Spirit would dwell richly in their lives, that they would love as they teach, they would discipline in love, that they would follow you and in turn teach these children to follow you. Lord, whether they are at Spring Valley Academy or at a home whether they're at Kettering College or one of the area universities or high schools, area elementary schools, God, they are your people, and we pray that your, your love would be shining brightly through them. Please help us to support them, to richly bless them, Father, with our thanks through this year, and we look forward, God, to hearing stories in the years to come of children who learn to follow you, who learn not to give up, who learn to believe that you have a plan for them through these teachers and through the classroom experiences. Lord, we thank you for our school, Spring Valley Academy, and the way that you've blessed us, this community with that, and enriched so many lives. Senior Holy Angels, to please inhabit that building so that more people would come to know, follow, and serve you. We ask this in Christ's name, all of his kids said together.
Amen. Amen. Would you please give them a round of applause for what they're doing? Thank you. Some years ago, my brother Paul called. He said, Faye, his wife, is pregnant again. I gulped, searching for what to say next. They had been pregnant five times before this, and they had no children. All of them had ended in miscarriages. Finally, I said, well, I'll pray like I've never prayed in my life. I'll get my whole church to pray. My brother was working as a pastor at the time, but his faith was frayed, and his belief in prayer was waning, and he said, well, maybe this time we ought not to pray, because after all, if prayer really worked, we'd have five children by now, wouldn't we? Maybe we shouldn't pray, and I certainly couldn't blame him for feeling that way. How do you explain unanswered prayers. Now, in the story of my brother, they uh, did have that child. He's a freshman in high school now. Uh, Later, they had another healthy baby boy, and he's doing well. But I almost hesitate to share the rest of their story with you because I know it doesn't always end up like that. And I know of couples who prayed just as much as we did and wanted a child just as badly as my brother and sister-in-law, and for whatever reason, God never answered that prayer. And every time they see a child, there is this deep ache, this pain within. Philip Yancey acknowledges the glib answer that we often give to that question, why do some prayers go unanswered? He writes in his wonderful book called Prayer, Does It Make Any Difference? He says, many books on prayer include a statement like this. God always answers prayer, but sometimes no is his answer. Have you ever heard that as an explanation? Sure. Then Yancey goes on to say, I read that statement and then think of specific friends and relatives who received the negative answer. Why? Were their prayers somehow deficient? I suspect all of us have known the agony and the ache of unanswered prayers, of begging God for something that is good and noble, and for whatever reason, it just feels like the prayer dissipates into this black abyss, this vacuum out there. What are we to do with unanswered prayers? Today we conclude a short series on the topic of prayer by tackling this sticky subject of unanswered prayer. Why does that happen? Well, if you would, you can find the outline there in your bulletin, and you can take some notes along the way as we explore some plausible answers to that question, looking at examples from Scripture that illustrate these possible answers. For starters, perhaps God says no to our prayer requests because maybe the request is just wrong. And God says no. We have examples of this in the Bible. For example, you remember the story in Matthew 17 of the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus is there with Peter, James, and John, and Jesus begins walking around with Moses and Elijah. That's when Peter speaks up and says, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Jesus responds by saying, no, there's still work left to do. Not a good idea. Answers, no, because it was a misguided request. 
Another example from Matthew chapter 20. You remember James and John were jockeying for a seating upgrade in the new kingdom of Christ, and so they sick their mother on Christ to ask of him this ill-conceived request. Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. And again, a misguided request, and so Jesus simply answers by saying, no, (laughs) that's not how my kingdom operates. Or you remember the story of when Jesus and his disciples were heading into a Samaritan village. And, of course, there was great hostility between the Israelites and the Samaritans. And so James and John asked Jesus, Hey, do you want us to call down fire from heaven? Luke chapter 9. As if they really could do that if they wanted to. And Jesus says, No, not a good idea. Thanks, but no thanks. We know of at least four incidents in Scripture where the man is so discouraged, so depressed, that he actually asks God to take his very life. Just help me in an assisted suicide. We hear this prayer from Moses, Jeremiah, Elijah, and Jonah. All of them, God, just kill me. Take my life. That's their request. And God says, no, 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 each time. I wonder if maybe when that dark cloud of depression finally lifted, if perhaps those great men of God reflected to say, oh, I'm so thankful that God didn't answer my prayer. In the words of the old country western song, sometimes God's greatest gifts are what? Unanswered prayers. See, there's one other country western listener here with me today. Well, it came out years ago by Garth Brooks. In it, he tells the story of returning to a high school reunion and there seeing the woman that he used to just be in love with. And he prayed and prayed, God, bring us together. That's the woman that I want to marry. And now, all these years later, He sees this woman again, and he wonders, what was I thinking? (laughs) Oh, and then the line in the song, you know, thank God for unanswered prayers. Just last year, I went to my 30-year high school reunion. There I saw a woman who I hadn't seen for many, many years, but remembered how, oh, man, I was just in love with this girl. I hoisted up more than a few prayers. God, bring us together. And when we saw each other at the reunion, I heard her mumbling under her breath, thank God (laughs) for unanswered prayers. So quickly, just turn to the person next to you and say, you are somebody's unanswered prayer. No, you don't have to do that. Here's the deal. It's just fundamental to the kind of God that we serve and to the nature of prayer that God always reserves the right to say no because often our very requests, because we don't understand all things, our requests are misguided and ill-conceived. And if we could see the bigger picture, we would be very thankful, thank God, that he said no. If we always got what it is we're praying for, then we would see a disaster. It would be a catastrophe. We see this sort of played out in an old Hollywood movie. Any of you remember the movie Bruce Almighty? It was starring Jim Carrey, who plays just this ordinary old guy called Bruce Nolan. And he complains to God that his prayers aren't being answered, and so God says, fine. I'll just answer every prayer you want in the affirmative. Anything you want, you'll get it. Oh, you would think that'd be a great life, wouldn't you? But, of course, many of his requests are very capricious in nature, and so... 
every prayer is answered. As he encounters a traffic jam, he just prays, God, part the traffic, and sure enough, the cars just part so that he can drive through at full speed in his brand-new sports car, kind of like the children of Israel walking through the Red Sea. This is great. His dog learns to use the toilet properly. Again, an answer to prayer. On one date with his girlfriend, who's played by Jennifer Aniston, he wants to enhance the romantic nature of that evening, and so he lassoes the moon. You remember that? And he brings the moon closer to them, so it's really romantic. The problem is, as with all of his requests, there are unintended consequences that he doesn't really think about because he's not really God. And so he thinks he wants the moon a little closer, but then what happens is that causes a tsunami over in Japan, kills thousands of people. Another time, he prays that everybody in his hometown of Buffalo, New York, will win the lottery. The problem is it dilutes the jackpot to the point that everybody's winning is less than what they had paid for with the ticket, and that ticks people off. Hey, you just don't always see everything. So sometimes the request is just misguided. Someone once asked Mahatma Gandhi, if you were given the power to remake the world, what would you do first? He replied, I would pray for the power to renounce that power. So sometimes God says no because the request is just wrong. Now, perhaps the request is noble and good, but the timing is off. So God doesn't say no. Rather, he simply says not yet. See, the timing is wrong, and so God says slow down, slow And I'm taking these scenarios from Bill Hybel's book, Too Busy Not to Pray. He gives many examples, again, from Scripture, where the timing wasn't God's timing. I think of Abraham, who waited 99 years before his prayer for a son was finally answered. Or the children of Israel who wandered in the wilderness for 40 years before at last they found the promised land. Or Jacob, who languished in prison for two years after he had interpreted the dream from the cupbearer and he thought that he was going to get out of jail. That would have been his timing to get right out of prison, but it wasn't God's timing. Or David, who waited his whole lifetime for his prayer of the building of the temple to be answered. And then when it was answered, he was not the guy to build the temple. Or the Israelites, who waited for centuries upon centuries for the long-awaited Messiah. God's timing is not always our timing. The prophet Isaiah gives us this promise. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Anybody here like to wait? Wait upon the Lord and your strength will be renewed. I hate to wait. I hate it when my plans are delayed even by 10 seconds. I hate waiting, don't you? This last week, I went to uh, one evening of tennis matches over here in Mason where I watched Roger Federer play that night. And after the match, of course, thousands of people were rushing out of the stadium there, and I tried to locate my car, which I had parked somewhere on this massive acres and acres and acres of an open field. To make matters worse, not only were there no markings anywhere on the parking lot, like A1, A2, or whatever, They weren't even parked in lines. I was late when I arrived at the tennis tournament, and so I didn't make a mental note of where I had parked. 
So here I am just wandering out in an open field. For 40 years, I just wandered <laughs> looking for my car. Couldn't find it. I had the little remote pushing the alarm, but I heard nothing. Meanwhile, thousands of people were just leaving, and so I'm walking in between cars trying to get out of there. I'm looking for my car, and I realize I'm just going to have to wait until everybody leaves, and then hopefully I'll be able to find my car. And eventually, you laugh, that's what happened. <laughs> I just had to wait. It's not like I had to get home right away for some emergency. I just don't like to be delayed. Those who wait upon the Lord, their strength will be renewed. They will soar as if on wings of eagles. Wait upon the Lord. Because as you're waiting for your prayer to be answered, perhaps the more important work God is doing in you. Did you catch that? I put that statement there in the outline of your bulletin, that what God is doing in you is more important than what God is doing for you. So the question is, will you trust God's timing? It's like the old southern gospel song that retells the story of Martha and Mary. They're all upset with Jesus because he comes four days too late to care for their brother Lazarus who died. The song goes like this. Lord, if you had been here, you could have healed him. He'd still be alive. But you're four days late and all hope is gone. Lord, we don't understand why you've waited so long. But his way is God's way. It's not yours or mine. But isn't it great when he's four days late, he's still on time. Timing is such a relative deal. I mean, we think waiting a year or two is a long time, but we're praying to the Alpha and the Omega, he who transcends time. It's not such a big deal to God like it is to us. I read this week about a tennis tournament for super seniors. One league featured a tournament for everybody over 90 years old. The final matched a 94-year-old playing a 92-year-old. At one point during one of the games, the 92-year-old had a beautiful cross-court shot. The 94-year-old lunged after it, but he couldn't quite get to it. And just then, he stood up straight and sighed, Oh, to be 92 again. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? If only I was young again, 92. Hey, time's a big deal to us, but... Not to God. So sometimes the timing is wrong. And God simply says, slow, slow down, not yet. Other times, it might be the person praying who is wrong. And God wants to grow that person. Again, from Heibel's book, I am in the wrong. And so God says, grow. Isaiah 59, you see it there in your outline. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Isaiah reminds us that God can hear your prayers even though sometimes we fear that he can't. It's not that his hearing is too dull, Isaiah says. Sometimes God wants to do something in us. It's our own shortcomings, our own sin that shields us from God. I love the prayer of British author John Bailey. He says, teach me, O God, so to use all the circumstances of my life today that they may bring forth in me the fruits of holiness 
rather than the fruits of sin. That's a good prayer. Whatever your answer, whatever your timing, may these circumstances today produce in me the fruits of holiness, not sin. Bailey then goes on to pray specifically, let me use success as material for thankfulness. Let me use reproach as material for long-suffering. Let me use pleasures as material for temperance. Let me use pains as material for endurance. So when you're waiting on God's answer, perhaps ask yourself, where is God calling me to grow? What is God teaching me through all of this? Now, those are the three categories that Hybels mentions in his book, but I have to add a fourth. <coughs> Still, another scenario. Sometimes the request may be in the sweet spot of God's will. The request may be on target. The timing could be right. There's nothing shielding you from God, and still the answer seems to be, no, God still seems to be so strangely silent and so distant. Why? On this one, I would simply say, the only answer I got is, I don't know. I don't know. Such is the messy mystery of prayer. I don't have some short word that rhymes with slow or grow or no to explain this one. But the truth is we all know this is reality. Sometimes prayers don't get answered and we don't know why. I think of my friend Terry. She was the perfect specimen of physical health. She and her husband both taught in the physical education department at the university where I used to serve. She would compete in marathons along with her husband, as well as Ironman competitions. She took health really seriously. They both did, along with their son, who at the time was about eight years old. Beautiful family. I mean, they ate right. They regularly ate tree bark and tofu and all of this stuff. <laughs> then came the diagnosis. One visit to the doctor. Melanoma. And thus began a two-year journey together. I regularly visited them. She would give regular updates, but it was just so discouraging because it seemed every time I went to visit, she just seemed a little weaker, walked a little slower. Her spirit seemed to be a little lower. We did everything. We followed the counsel of James, and I went to their home. We had an anointing service, as Scripture tells us to do. We confessed our sins and said, if there's anything that's blocking us, God, God, please, I, I just begged God, please. We had an all-night prayer vigil at the college on her behalf, praying for nothing but Terry. God. We're just begging you as a community here. Save her. Heal her. You can do this, God. We did something very similar for other people in the community. When the university president was diagnosed with a rare and aggressive form of cancer, for him, we also held an all-night prayer vigil. In his story, it seemed to be a miracle. His cancer went into remission, and he continues to live a strong, healthy, abundant life. 
God answered our prayers. But ironically, in his story, a few years later, his daughter was diagnosed with a rare, aggressive form of cancer. We held an all-night prayer vigil for her. We anointed her. She had three beautiful young girls, great family, wonderful person. She died. How do you understand this? The phone call came, as I feared it would, from Terry's husband. This morning she died. So why was that prayer unanswered? Again, the only answer I have is we don't know. We just don't know. Sometimes we simply need to bow humbly before God and acknowledge that he is God and we are not. His ways are not our ways. Faith is not praying the right prayer or praying enough prayers or praying spiritual-sounding prayers so that we always get what we want. Sometimes prayer is simply hanging on to God and saying, I'm not going to let go. I'm going to have faith and trust you even when the answer comes back. No, or you seem so painfully distant. Sometimes we just don't know. But this I do know. At the heart of the gospel is an unanswered prayer. Have you ever thought about that? Jesus, clutching the grass in the Garden of Gethsemane, he cries out to the Father, a desperate prayer, God, please, if there is any way, take this cup from me. Keep me from going through this awful, terrible death. Please, God. This is the most desperate prayer ever prayed from the most discerning spirit who has ever lived, from the purest heart that has ever beat, for deliverance from the most unjust suffering ever known. And all he heard from that desperate prayer was silence. Heaven was not moved. The cup was not taken away. The request was denied. The prayer was unanswered. And from that unwanted, unmerited suffering came the hope of the world that literally remade human history. And because of that sacrifice, because of that unanswered prayer, The ultimate anguish now we find in the cross. The ultimate human anguish, the answer to every human anguish, including the anguish of unanswered prayers. The answer is a sin-stained, blood-soaked cross where God himself died. And because of that unanswered prayer, we now gather in community with a shared hope that someday God will set things right. And we share the belief that God really does know what is ultimately best. And because of this, we share the hope that joins our hearts together that someday there will be no more crying, there will be no more pain, there will be no more cancer because of an unanswered prayer.
Father, you have heard our prayer. Send your Spirit to fall afresh on your people as our prayer. Go with us now in your name. Amen.